Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's West Cork Literary Festival event. We're here tonight with um, Jamie O'Connell, whose novel Diving for Pearls was published today by Doubleday and uh, Penguin Books Ireland. We're also here with Jamie's editor and publisher, Fiona Murphy, and with Sophie White, who's going to be in conversation with Jamie tonight. Um, just before we start tonight's event, I just want to thank our funders, the Arts Council of Ireland, Cork County Council and their Library and Arts Services, Fulcher Ireland and the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union for funding all of our events this year and every year. Um, Jamie's book, Diving for Pearls, is available from Bantry Bookshop, so we would encourage you all to support Bantry Bookshop or your own local bookshop wherever you live. It's an absolutely fabulous read, so do go out and pick up your copy. Um, today's event is one in a series of events that we're doing online this year. Uh, we will have other events coming up throughout June, and in the coming days we'll be announcing a packed schedule for July. We have workshops, readings, and seminars coming up over the next couple of months, so hopefully you'll join us for something else. Um, once tonight's event is underway, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a chat box where you can chat to one another, and if you have any questions, for Jamie, you can put them into the Q&A box and towards the end of the event, um, Sophie will take a couple of questions from the audience for, for Jamie. So I'll hand you over now to Fiona Murphy, who is the editorial director um, for Double Day and Transworld Ireland. And I hope you all enjoy the event. Thanks so much, Emer. Hi everyone, and welcome to the launch of Jamie O'Connell's wondrous debut novel, Diving for Pearls. I'm Fiona Murphy, Editorial Director of Doubleday Ireland and Jamie's very proud editor. I'll just say a few thank yous and a few words about Jamie before handing over to Sophie and Jamie for what promises to be a fantastic event. Firstly, thank you to Emer and everyone at Cork, West Cork Literary Festival for hosting and supporting this event. While we're inching closer to in-person events, we're still not quite there. And Emer and her team have provided an essential platform for so many authors and publishers over the last year or more. We value it more than you can know and can't wait to visit you all in Bantry again in the near future. Thank you to Amy Johnston, who has organised the unmissable publicity campaign for Diving for Pearls. I'm sure some of you will have already seen print interviews and heard Jamie on RT Radio 1 this morning. So be warned, there's a lot more to come. Um, to Bantry Bookshop and indeed all local bookshops who've been pulling out all the stops to make books like Diving for Pearls available to their customers throughout the last 15 months. Thank you for everything you've been doing and continue to do. And thanks also to Sophie White who is chairing tonight's event. I'm convinced Sophie has superpowers. As well as producing brilliant journalism, she's published a cookbook, two hilarious novels satir satirising influencer culture, and her recent non-fiction collection, Corpsing, is an extraordinary piece of writing, painful, powerful, beautiful, and also very funny at times. She's also the co-host of podcast Mother of Pod and The Creek Dive, which are an absolute must if you haven't already subscribed. Thank you, Sophie, for championing Diving for Pearls and for being here tonight to launch it into the world. And my most important thank you of the night goes to Jamie himself for trusting me with his precious writing and for being such a joy to work with from the edits right through to how he's engaged with all of the publicity obligations that come with putting your work out into the world. I got to meet Jamie in Dublin this afternoon where we may have broken some rules by popping a bottle of champagne in Stephen's Green, but oh my God, it was a beautiful moment after not seeing each other or indeed anyone else for such a long time. I first met Jamie when he joined the Penguin Random House Ireland sales team in August 2019. Um, I hadn't realised he was a writer until I somehow came across one of his short stories, which completely blew me away. So I quietly emailed his agent, Marianne Gunn O'Connor, to see if she could send me his novel on the sly. Diving for Pearls felt like everything I was looking for, both as a reader and an editor, a sumptuous setting with a dark underbelly a large cast of characters, all precisely drawn with rich and diverse backgrounds, complex family dynamics, messy pasts and web of secrets, all of which combine to open up the world of Dubai in a very personal and intimate way. It's never finger wagging or judgmental and it succinctly captures the complexity of a place like Dubai where you can be appalled by the excess and yet give an arm to go to one of the famous all day brunches. But while Dubai is a very central character in the novel, at its heart, Diving for Pearls is a novel about connection, about family, about doing one's best to survive. You will fall in love with Siobhan. She might be superficial, label obsessed, mad to show everyone she's loving her life, but she's also fiercely protective of her brother and her children and trying to make sure they have the best possible life. 
while wearing the best knockoff Rolex she can while doing it. Asim is a young, arrogant and rich, but he's also lost and struggling to understand his place within his family. Lydia finds herself in a dangerous profession, feeling it's the only option available to her when her family has turned their back. Each and every con character will worm their way into your heart. And I can promise you, this is a book you'll feel compelled to press into the hands of friends and family so you can discuss all the drama contained within its covers. One of the true joys of this job is publishing debut authors and introducing new voices to readers all over the world. This particular publication day feels even more special as Jamie is a former colleague and a, and a close friend and to be part of the process is a real privilege. Prior to popping the champagne today, we both had a little cry when we met in the office. Um, this is mostly due to loss of all social skills over the past year and genuine kind of joy at seeing people after so long. But it was also a special moment to publish someone this talented who has been waiting for this day for so long. Described by John Boyne as hugely engaging from a talented new writer, by Anne Griffin as a compelling tale uncovering a world of secrets, injustice, and for the lucky few escape. And Colin Barrett says it's shimmering, beguiling, and ruthless, a fizzing and a sure debut. I think we can all agree the future is looking bright. So please join me in raising a glass to Jamie and to this incredible novel, Diving for Pearls. <laughs> and now over to Jamie. Hi everyone. Uh, so just before we start, I just wanted to say a quick a uh, couple of thank yous myself, because if I wait till the end, it'll be on my mind the whole time we're chatting, Sophie. So <laughs> probably better that I uh, say them now. Uh, firstly, Emer and the West Cork Literary Festival, thank you so much. It's to be able to have a launch at this time is is wonderful. And funny enough, a lot of my friends, if anyone heard the interview earlier, live abroad. So in a weird way, they can actually come to this launch in a way they wouldn't have been able to come to if it was actually physical. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and then to Sophie, uh, sorry, to Fiona, my editor, who has made something that I've uh, had a dream of. I, I, I remember being like 11 years of age and I heard uh, an interview with Maeve Vinci on uh, the television and it just put the spark in my head about being a writer. But I also remember at that time of reading like the Rob, reading Roald Dahl's and seeing that little orange logo in the corner, the little penguin. So it's a big day to be published and have that little orange logo on my book after all these years. It's 25 years later and the, the dream has always stayed there. And so it's a big day. So that's why there's a few tears because it was 25 years in the in the making. Uh, so thank you so much, Fiona, for that. And as well, just to the wider uh, Penguin Rent House teams, uh, especially Amy, who's like a publicist extraordinaire, and, uh, and to Sophie, who had uh, put my book everywhere. I walked around Dublin today and I just, just seem to be in every window. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I just feel an author, it takes one person, an author to write a manuscript, but it actually takes a team to create a book. And I thank my like everyone in the team who's made this this possible. Finally, just a huge thank you to Marianne Gunnar, has been working with me for a decade and, you know, has just had faith. And days when I haven't had faith where, you know, and uh, there, you know, either the manuscript needed a new rewrite or to take it further, or you know, on the days when rejections came in, I was like, "Am I any good, Mary? And am I actually any good?" Like, and she'd say, "You know, this is going to happen. Just, just be patient. This is the process." And so, she's always been as much a friend as anything as a, as an agent. So, so thank you to everyone. And I think that's all my my thanks. Uh, so yeah, Sophie. <laughs> Hi, congratulations, Jamie, on a stunning book Hi. and bring it out into Thanks. the world. Thank you so much for having me along to do this conversation. I read Diving for Pearls first a few months ago and I just fell into the world, fell in love with the world and the characters, uh, no matter how kind of occasionally shallow and awful they seem. They're always so human. I think because I'm shallow and awful so much of the time, <laughs> we all are. Um, and uh, it actually wasn't the first time I'd heard of you or your writing because you are such an acclaimed short story writer already. And I knew about your work and I knew that I knew that you were working on a manuscript mm -hmm. um, because we have a friend in common, Teresa, and yeah. I, when Teresa told me that you were working on something longer, I was like, this is going to be a really special book. And it is. Oh, and I'm you. so excited for all the people who haven't read it yet. And um, so here we go. Diving for Pearls, right? I 
absolutely adore the kind of ambition and audacity of it really in terms of just taking this like really kind of almost mirage like place like Dubai a kind of city that rises from the desert and is so um, kind of a bombastic kind of place in terms of its architecture, its culture. Um, and then, you know, kind of making it a stage for very human stories. And I really loved it. And I feel like the greatest opening of a book in a long time is um, like not Tom Cruise, <laughs> like climbing the, I'm about to I really embarrass myself. How do you pronounce it? Barge, barge. Uh, Burj. The, the Burj, thank you. Burj Khalifa, yeah. Yeah, but it's a great sort of sweeping opening um, because it's such a bird's eye view of the the kind of the mega luxury and the kind of mega wealth in Dubai. And then we kind of like we sort of swoop from quite literally a dizzying height of a movie star landing um, to the uh, Dubai Marina and the death of a young woman. And um, I've heard you say that it was an opening you borrowed from one of your influences. Um, and yes. I love that. I love that yeah. kind of callback. So tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I had read uh, Let the Great World Spin, the Colin McCann book in 2009. It's one of my favorite books of the last 20 years. And uh, so much of the book in terms of its structure and the way it's set up, actually, if I'm honest, because I come from short stories. And I really, if I'm honest, plotting a novel is just a different new skill set to learn. And I think to, to have had someone sort of create a portrait of a city that was so brilliant and vivid uh was a great sort of template to work from so he opens up it, the, the novel is set in new york in the 1970s in a key moment as well in new york history when uh philip petit, petit uh walked between yes. the the twin towers twin on the towers. road and it mm. just that opening that he does is so cinematic and he goes from the wide kind of panorama shots of this happening and you can you, it's almost like a film in your head to the, the kind of plastic wrapper rolling down the street the close-up shots and it just feels so big and it captures everything that you know New York was then which was in some ways quite rough but actually at the same time it was, yeah. it was yeah but then it was Halston and Studio 54 and there's this weird it's like five cities in one it's it's a total contradiction and actually Dubai is all of those things. It's it's everyone who goes there meet, goes to a different city, you know, uh, depending on where you're coming from in the world. And yeah. uh, so definitely the Colin McCann book in terms of prologue and then actually how I thought about the book and the viewpoints of the book. I was like, that's that really works. And also, as I said, it works. If I'm honest, it works with my short story background, because to stay with one character at that point in time, I'm working on it <laughs> for 70 or 80,000 words. I, I kind of like the intensity of I, I, you know, every word and sentence and just really getting into a character in a very short space of time. Uh, so mm. this this way of suited me in terms of describing a city, but also suited me in what I felt was probably my skill set. Yes, well, I think your skill set comes through in that every chapter is so beautifully crafted. Uh, but I think you're being modest saying that you were kind of leaning on <laughs> that because you haven't necessarily plotted a, um, a novel before because the plot is, I think what you do with them, um, Diving for Pearls, that made me want to just keep coming back to it and keep coming back to it was that you would set out this incredibly vivid stage for the drama and then it's the characters. Like you inhabit these um, I mean, it's kind of seven or eight, I mean, by my count, uh, <laughs> characters. Seven. Seven, yeah. I was like, is, is Joan counted? She's counted. Yes, you uh, embody oh. these characters. They all are, you know, coming from very different spheres. Their their lived experience is so different. Uh, but you know, the the distinction between them is, you know, it's it's just kind of it's perfectly executed. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask you about kind of how you sort of started to research the characters, how they kind of came into focus for you? Uh, in terms of how I generally would write character, I'm always looking to hear how they speak. I'm always looking to, for the ear for uh, a little phrase that would be uniquely them or, you know, 
uh, like even when Joan says like she's going to buy Rocco another bike and he's like no I'm not buying him another bike he's only one arse and two legs like uh, <laughs> and and once I can hear that that for me is almost like a pitch like a piece of music and then it often needs the piece of music continuing on in that note or something or in that key uh, mm. and that's I suppose generally how I'd create character and sometimes quite often when I'm writing they do stuff that surprises me I'm writing away and I'm going oh they just said that and I kind of look back and I'm kind of I, I hadn't consciously predicted that that was what was going to come out of their kind of mouth and then when I want to turn them into beyond sort of sort of these just a voice but into actually something I feel as a compelling story I'm looking for the thing that will emotionally ruin them <laughs> I know this sounds <laughs> <laughs> awful to say but if you want a, a compelling story find their Achilles heel find the thing that if you push it will really cause them to crumble you know their foundations will be shook and mm. actually because of that very reason Siobhan I found actually the hardest character to write of any of them uh and that was because her life is good she, of anyone in the book she has a on the surface great life and everything's very secure and safe and she was the one that I had to kind of go back and work through and really sit and go what would make Siobhan panic and, and you know worry and then I thought her family yeah she's and her, then she really panics <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 I'm rightly so and I just and and then for me that was very important I realized with Siobhan the depth is in she's actually a fish out of water and as much as she loves to buy on all the surface levels mm. she misses her mother like you know she's on the phone to her mother every day you know she her dad dead dying she's not gotten over she is protective of her brother she's protective of her kids she wants her marriage to work she's actually a person who human relationships rather than a career are her thing you know and, and mm. once that kind of figured that out then her character felt much more vivid and real so uh uh but that's how I generally found characters but in terms of the characters who are maybe non-western uh mm. uh I, I visited Dubai a lot in the kind of early 2010s and uh I spoke to a lot of maids and taxi drivers whenever you know the opportunity arose and uh I, would, I suppose I'll caveat everything saying like this is fiction it's based on my personal experience of talking to these people and what's arisen out of that I'm not in any way saying like I am the expert on anyone else's culture or, or trying to speak for, for them but in terms of the fiction uh, I wanted to understand them and certainly feel that I was saying things that was fair and honest and wasn't I, like everything I put every detail I put in there I made sure there was a fact behind it it was it was definitely uh, and, and so that on that surface level, I was, I was very, I was trying to really do what I could to, to be, to get them right, you know, get these people authentic. Uh, yeah. But what emerged as I wrote them was how everybody is just the same. Everyone just wants to feel safe. Everyone wants to feel loved. Everyone wants the best for their family and everyone wants to try and do something with their life. And, and every character mm. that I came down to, that's underneath them all. They just want to feel loved and, loved and safe and secure and, and loved. And, and I just, it was kind of good as well because I think we live in a world that is so label heavy, you know, in terms of, you know, but actually I think if we, all these conversations we have around this could just be, but we're all human. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's kind of, uh, that was the wonderful thing I discovered as I wrote them. I was like, I just felt, deep affinity to them and I think of any of them to hear I actually really connected to when I wrote I really just found his character a joy to write yeah I mean I suppose before we go on let's do a kind of a little top line of like who we were all talking about so the cast of Died and Pearls are you know they're not all directly connected but we do have Siobhan as you described who's gone to Dubai with her husband Martin and their two kids and they have Jeet who is an Ethiopian maid who lives with them in like a kind of a, a small bedroom and and you know she has come to Dubai to earn money but like on arrival her passport is taken by the agency that she will find work through and that is kind of a norm of sorts there there's Tahir who is sending I mean I feel like I'm actually I'm telling you a story that you oh. wrote which is kind of <laughs> insane um but there is uh Tahir who you just mentioned there who's the taxi driver working to send money home to his family and um then there's Trevor Siobhan's brother who comes for a holiday holiday and almost kind of provides this kind of outsider perspective on the whole sort of um, way that Dubai works. And of course, then we have um, Asim and Hayam. Hayim, 
I am. I mean, yeah. you've actually, you've got an enormous kind of ensemble with everyone. And it's actually, so it's amazing as a reader, how much connection you, the writer, create here. Because I, like you said, Tahir, am I saying his name right? Tahir? Tahir, yeah, yeah. Tahir's story, and he's the taxi driver, and he lives in this just really, really grim circumstances. His life is is very just, it's labor. It's so like, it's just so thankless for him, you know, uh, uh, every day. And he is a real kind of, I want to say victim of, well, he's a victim of circumstance in the story. Where we leave him is, is difficult for the reader, mm. I think. But it does, I think, show like how much connection you've managed to create. In fact, on that, well, we have a little bit of um, a passage from the book. And um, I thought it might be interesting maybe to start, if you would uh, read to us, um, about Tahir's living conditions. I'm here like on page 74. Um, <laughs> turn to your reader, page 74. I'd love to hear you read a little bit about how Tahir lives and then maybe we might have that incredible scene of the brunch and that oh, can the kind brunch. of show the two sides of Dubai oh. that you have <laughs> represented in Diving for Pearls, the kind of double life of Dubai. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, 74, I'll just read two very short paragraphs. Uh, he cues to use the hot ring, Burnt rice stuck to the countertops, the walls covered in spatters, tarnished and blackened saucepans, sticky residue underfoot, pigs. Tahir glances over his shoulder, men sit on benches, scooping up slop with torn bread, a sea of bloodshot eyes. Mohammed sits at the far end of the far wall with the other six men from his room and waves over, waves over Tahir nods back. Uh, will I read on or... Is is that enough? I do love I do love okay, that next sorry. paragraph. Oh yeah, okay. It kind of speaks to the repetition as well of his life. Okay. Uh, beads of sweat form onto Hear's brow as he cooks the small piece of fish and rice. He blinks a number of times, but his eyes remain dry. He stretches, reaching his hand towards the ceiling. What time is it again? Food, prayers, bed. Then it all begins again. <sighs> it's amazing insight. Um, I suppose to how like I suppose how the prosperity of Dubai comes at a real human cost and you know he's obviously kind of an element of this enormous kind of glittering dazzling machine you know and just trying desperately to get by but it's a very tough existence and he's lonely alone you know I, I find that all very it was very very upsetting you know and confronting I think because it's obviously not something that is just you know unique to Dubai it is something that underpins the entire you know world like yeah well I our think comfort with, is costing somebody else yes and I, I think in even a wider conversation than Dubai is quite often like migrant markets like that they actually leave kids who are like six and seven years old and you know and they're going away to pay for the children's education and so you know one parent is away working and, and coming home once a year and that's a human cost that's a huge human cost for you know for, for those children growing up but you know ultimately you know when you do talk to you know when I've spoken to maids and taxi drivers like they have a plan like they have plans in place it's not they're like you know this will pay for my child to go to school this will pay for me to you know buy a nice home for my family you know that there's there's as much ambition and hope in their life, you know, and I don't, I say, I don't sound otherness here, you know, it's, it's all a human experience, yeah. but they go there mm -hmm. with exactly the same Western viewpoint of hoping that this will give them an opportunity to, to better their lives and for, for that of their family as well. But I think the human cost, be you Irish or um, Ethiopian or from Asia, of long term being away from immediate members of your family is really, uh, it's a big price. It's a big, big yeah. price. Uh, for sure. And I think I've got older as well. I just think I've, I think when you're young, you're going off and see the world and you don't think so much about your family nearby and stuff like that. But even since I've written the book, I just feel more and more like I love having people close, you know, the people who matter to me. It's, it's become so much more important. So it's a big, it's a big cost uh, to pay. Mm, absolutely. And then I suppose, I mean, it's very uh, vivid in its rendering of um, the sort of sumptuous lifestyle of kind of you know, sort of maybe expats who've come to Dubai. Um, would you like to read the brunch scene? Because This is my favourite piece to read. <laughs> yeah. uh, because it's, uh, I think it, it reminds me of reading this kind of 
uh, Nigella Lawson cookbooks, you know, just kind of like the sumptuous kind of, uh, sorry, I'm talking about yeah. my own writing now, I realise that, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> no, uh, you must own that. <laughs> okay. uh, so we're in a scene here, so in Dubai, uh, just for people who don't know, so on Friday, there's this thing called Friday brunch, so it happens about one in the afternoon, and it goes on till maybe about early evening, like six or seven, and you pay to go into the door of a fancy, you know, a five-star hotel. It's expensive, it will cost about thousand dirhams, maybe about 200 euro, and you go in and then you're sort of taken to a table and you're offered this kind of room of what they kind of call kitchens. And mm. uh, they have like the English dinner kitchen and you go in there and they'll have everything from parsnips through to Yorkshire puddings, through to every kind of meat you can think of, beef, you know, the, the whole range, like every thing, single thing from English mustard through to that of an English kitchen. And then you go to the next room, it's the seafood kitchen and it'll be everything from lobster Amazing. to- I had my first oyster at one of them, which was one and only at the time it's ever happened. Reverse uh, was, away from the oyster. <laughs> but I was there and I was like, oh, I have to, I have to give it a go. Uh, and then, you know, so every kind of seafood you can think of and scallops and all sorts of things. And then you move on to the next kitchen, which is the cheese kitchen. And I just couldn't believe the cheeses they had, like cheeses that come from a cottage in, in Tipperary, you know, like literally Irish. Amazing. Uh, and then <laughs> like the next kitchen would be like the Thai kitchen and then you have the Indian kitchen and then you have the bread space. And of course, Irish people don't eat the bread. You'll fill yourself up too fast. Oh my get God. The, yeah, no, go <laughs> easy the on the bread. Yeah, that's, that's how they get, get the you. Get the value. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's incredible and you kind of go down you sit your seat and you're chatting away and there's music and it's it, like I mean it is a wonderfully indulgent experience and I'm not knocking it as I really did enjoy myself there and I you know that that's I will be honest about that uh and then you're kind of drinking your glass of champagne which never ends because they're sneakily topping you up the whole time you're there so oh, you're yeah. kind of Siobhan you know, now uh, bore the brunt yeah. of that in the book <laughs> well I have actually the song she's singing I have sung with a couple of drinks in me so <laughs> so uh it's actually from the snapper you know Molly my Irish Molly yes <laughs> anyway so uh so then you sit down and yeah so it's just this incredibly indulgent experience and and then finally there's the dessert room which is the bit I'm actually going to read for you here which is of all the amazing desserts and I mean every dessert you can possibly imagine like everything from gold cakes to amazing so i'm just gonna read it's two paragraphs just of, of the desserts behind the chocolate fountains trevor gazes at the rows of mini cakes 10 20 30 easily 50 varieties half of these names he couldn't pronounce morsels of flake chocolate glazed summer fruits lemon strawberry and chocolate mousses blackberry tartlets with vanilla flavored mascarpone cream flaky and shortbread pastries fruit tarts, salted caramel croque en brioche, fresh fruit flutes, eclairs, perfectly round macaroons in a rainbow of colours, gold leaf chocolate cakes, gianduia filled fish rolls <laughs> with double chocolate sauce and toasted hazelnuts, a crepe stand, chocolate syrup, bananas, nuts, sprinkles, marshmallows, honey, summer fruit, Beside it, an ice cream stand, mint, mocha, proline, divine vanilla, choco orange, pistachio, rum and raisin. Trevor's plate remains empty as he looks, unable to move. Where do I start? Uh, where, where to start? All, all other diners seem to, be making, seem to be having the same trouble. What should I choose, darling? That looks delicious. Oh, I'm such a pig. Rocco has no problem picking ice cream flavours and crepe toppings. Maybe that's the secret. To be comfortable in Dubai, you have to be born there. Mm. It is um, interesting about how the kind of side of all that, like consumption, it can be just jarring and a bit grotesque. Mm. I think especially Trevor's kind of navigation of the world in the book, it's very, um, I suppose it, it provides us with our entry point into it as well. Like, oh, his observing of Siobhan shopping and like mm. getting all of the labels and mm. and his uh, clear kind of like, I suppose, awkwardness in interacting with Jeet. I really, really identified with that because mm. I think that's such an Irish thing of like, oh God, there's a person here trying to put my dishes, do my dishes mm. or something. And you, yeah. 
I, I don't know, I've definitely had awkward encounters where I've tried to take them back and oh, do yeah. them and it leads to way worse. They're just looking at you yeah. like, stop it, you absolute yeah. <laughs> um, it, fool. Because it, it, it is such a, an Irish, for me as an Irish person, I think that was why coming from a country where immigration has just been part of our society for what, 200 years or, you know, well into the 19th century. And mm. we went to countries and we're doing the menial jobs and, and, and all that, you know, and kind of being that in that space. And I just, to then be the person, you know, in that position where people are minding you in that way, I just, I don't know, it kind of caught me. And I, I mean, the anecdote I had for that, and sorry if anyone's heard this before, but was when I first went to Dubai and I stayed at a friend's villa and I dropped off my bags and then I went down to uh, have the catch-ups and stuff. I hopped off the plane and a cup of Barry's tea and, you know, that's how you get past the, the front door. Uh, <laughs> bring your Barry's. And, uh, and so we're chatting away. And then I went up to the, the room upstairs and everything was like, my case was emptied out and the clothes were hung up. And I mean, they were ironed like, I like I hate ironing. I like I just give stuff a rub at best. Uh, whereas these were like they could have gone into a shop, you know, they were that kind of amazing. And they were so and I, I felt that, oh, I'm not sure this feels different to, you know, what I was used to. Uh, but then after two weeks and I went home and of course all my clothes are worn and they're all bundled up back into the case, case up in the bed at home, open it out. I'm like, God, I'd love like some of it. <laughs> it was I mean... So I just was like, I it just made me so aware of how easily we adapt to luxury and how what oh, feel, yeah, can feel yeah. normal, you know? And uh, uh, Tina Fey actually in her book, Bossy Pants, I don't know if you read, very funny oh, book, really, really that. good. I love that, yeah. yeah. But she talks about being at photo shoots and the first couple of times it was new to her, you know, she was obviously becoming famous. It was so novel and everything was just amazing. But like by the fifth photo shoot, she was like wanting the sushi and you know, like she's like, you just yeah. adapt to, you know, she even said in it, she's like, somebody needs to do a study to like figure out how quickly humans can adapt to luxury. She's like, yes. someone could, it, it, she said it, it's almost instantaneously that it suddenly becomes the norm. Yes, so. yeah. If you've ever read any of the kind of celebrity writers of like yeah. the things that they want to have in their, um, mm. or their changing rooms. And I always remember in, um, is it Whitnail and I, where they're talking mm. about they needed to find 5,000 brown M&Ms or Ozzy wouldn't go on oh. stage. That's, uh, I think that's, that's uh, I think that's from that. Yes, it's uh, that sounds like somebody just wanting to do something to prove a point. <laughs> oh yeah, completely, yeah. completely. But I'd say that like, yes, I'd say just the kind of like awful behavior escalates really fast when you're just being kind of served constantly. Mm, yeah. And I remember the same, like this book is set in kind of like 20 sort of 10-ish, isn't it? Just after the recession. And like, yeah. I remember a few years before that meeting a friend of mine who'd grown up in Dubai um, and he'd gone to boarding school in Ireland. So like in Ireland, they were like, uh, you know, doing well as a family, but like, mm -hmm. you know, so they were able to like, you know, let them stay here and, and board um, at school. And then he'd go over to Dubai for all the summer holidays and the Christmas holidays. Mm -hmm. And they had like what he called a houseboy. And I was like, oh my God, what's that? Yeah. And then I was so put off by the fact that they called this man a house boy. And it's, I think it's just that thing of like being confronted with the inequality yeah. Yeah. in the world. Like it is, it just discomforts us and it should. Mm. And I think that's something that you genuinely explore like really um, thoroughly in Diving for Pearls without it becoming an issues driven book in any yeah. way. It's yeah. just, it's there you I think as a as the author you know you're not necessarily casting judgment in any direction and um, you know you've just created a very real story that is set in the very real reality of a lot of people and um you know I think it's it's really something that it stayed with me a lot between picking it up like you know when you're reading a book that it kind of colors your whole days that you're reading it and you know I'd be kind of I mean rushing back as well but like I'd be it really could set a lot of things in motion in my head about kind of how our behaviors in the west you know are you know impacting the rest of the world and, and impacting kind of people's lives and and it, it so it was really like I think it's just great to have managed to strike a perfect balance between genuinely very entertaining thoroughly human and then also making some really valid points did you come into it going I want to talk about this quite huge sort of ecosystem of inequality 
or did you come into it going, I really want to talk about Dubai and I mean, what kind of came first for you, you know? Um, I suppose it's, it's a delicate balance for both because on the one hand, I went there, there was things I saw which kind of sparked, you know, my imagination and, and that kind of thing. But a reader buys a book to read a story and character and it's so important to me that if you just want to read a story, you know, about characters and their experience, I hope that it can just be read and enjoyed as a summer read and you can just enjoy oh, it. Funny. And then maybe, and just, you know, and, and then maybe some of the ideas will stay with you afterwards. I like the worst thing I think is, you know, if someone thinks it's sort of a polemic about uh, how other people live, you know, uh, I, I think it maybe as writers, and I don't know if you feel the same, it's merely bringing attention to something and maybe asking a question. And hmm. I think if you try and answer that question, you sometimes ruin fiction you know and and, yeah. and so uh i the worst thing that could happen is my reader is bored so i always like that that for that, me that is does not if someone <laughs> if worry. someone you know that for me like would be the worst thing since i was really bored by this book and that would be really upsetting for me so i you know even in I, I feel like you should write a sentence that's seductive enough that the reader wants to read the next sentence. So, you know, you kind of lay, you make sure there's a bit of humor or a reflection or something that just means the next sentence is something you want to get to. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so I never, me as a writer, I love to write kind of character and portraits and like almost the, like it's a portrait of a city and it's a portrait of these people. But I also think there's a reader who maybe just wants to read a book <laughs> and enjoy a book <laughs> and and have a bit of sun like I just think at the moment like we're all going to be here for our staycations and stuff and I'm like hopefully you can just go to Dubai for a few hours and and, and learn something about a, a different culture you know so oh, for me it's the two things are the two things are constantly in tension with each other I suppose uh but for me the reader's experience has to come ab above everything it's really important for me that uh uh that the reader loves my characters and then goes to hell and back with my characters when the characters they love are now in really difficult situations, <laughs> you yes, know, and, you're, and yeah. you're sitting on the edge of your seat, so. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I genuinely was like very, very troubled um, by by the ending. I won't go into it because it's not, it's not spoilery <laughs> to say that it is a complex ending. You know, there is no kind of, uh, you know, happy little tied up in a boat. So that's not a spoiler no. to say that. Um, no. But I, you know, I was quite bereft by some of the things. And I think that is such a testament to how much a writer has made us care, you know, like how real these people and their journey kind of is, is, oh. is slash was. I feel like it's weird to describe them in the past tense mm -hmm. because, um, <laughs> you know, they, they stand forever there, you know, that kind of way. Oh, um, and is the ending something that you kind of grappled with? Funny, and, and this is actually Fiona, my editor, when we had discussions with her at the ending. So the book takes place over a week, and it's actually an actual week that happened. It's in November 2010. And what was interesting about that week, it's weird the way I, like, it's just serendipity that it just, as I researched, this week just became very interesting because uh, it was the week Tom Cruise came to Dubai, which was my opening and how I wanted to work. But it also was the time that the IMF came to Dublin, and obviously with the the recession it was just such a it was such a low yeah. point in Ireland and it also was the the week that the Terminal 2 opened in Dublin which is actually when the first direct Dublin Dubai flight started so it was just such a mm. weird amalgam event so the book had this really tight time frame of a week and I suppose you're talking about the investigation of a death like it's very hard to have a resolution in seven days of a, of, of a death you know so uh, mm. and, and from my short story background I was like people would be very happy with an open ending because in short stories, you don't necessarily have to have such a rounded out ending, but definitely working with Fiona, was like, people have staged with your character for 300 pages, do give them something they care about what's happened to these people. So uh, I definitely, yeah. I, was, I was almost learning something about the novel versus the short story as I was writing the end and Fiona was really good for guiding me on that. Uh, and I did the best I could to kind of give resolution where I could. And especially with the, for me, I suppose Trevor and Siobhan are the, the driving forces of you know that they're the lead characters i suppose really in the book mm. uh so there is resolution for them but i'd created a world that was so diverse and 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 unsolved i suppose really in the way that mm. i think colin mccann's book it's new york is so chaotic and so much is going on to put a bow on the end of it would have been writing about a different world it would have been like one of my characters flying it would have just yeah. gone against it would have gone against the rules of the world i created you know what i mean the the dubai of this book that's it's it not gonna, yeah. yeah like reading it i was like mm. this ending is very true to this book 
mm. you know and i mean can no. i read no i don't like i don't want to read the last no. Um, uh-huh. line but the last can you hear me okay yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh sorry sorry um the last line echoes um a line that appears earlier in the book yeah. and I mean without kind of giving away the ending I think that you really beautifully really deftly mm. kind of illustrated this kind of like mm. sort of cycle mm. of 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 really civilization like in terms of kind of prosperity in breeding inequality breeding pain and then coming right back to what you kind of described at the beginning which is the thing that unites us is that just desire for safety security love and and comfort you know and then um, it was I thought like it's a really really smart book like I kind of just can't overstate how it is there is just an intellectual like heft here that is I'm telling you like it's it's the best like in terms of just thought provoking like you know just literary banger is what I would call it. Like in terms of like sit down in the sun, get a nice patch of sun, trip to Dubai, but also, you know, I just think that you've really drawn in some really complex things and woven them into just like a very enjoyable reading experience, you know, and it's just, it's really incredible. Like I really, I really hope that you are so, so happy and proud with Diving for Pearls. Has it become the book you thought it would become? You know, when you start a book, you kind of feel you've got something in your head and it's all about trying to get it out. I I kind of have to work, and maybe I don't know how you write yourself, but half knowing things and half not knowing things. It's a weird, I kind of, if I know everything, I don't want to write it. It's like it's already been written. Do you know what I mean? I need those, as I said earlier, the characters surprising and just doing something off track. Mm. Uh, I need that sort of spontaneity and sometimes that's led to stories that are going to sit in drawers forever because spontaneity led west and I should have gone east you know so <laughs> uh, but uh, in the, in this case I just and even when it came to kind of plot and obviously the seven characters doing things all at the same time over seven days so that in my head that that's kind of you know at times you get like oh how's this going to work but usually I found if I just took a day off or two days off and just said brain I'm leaving it in your your hands, like subconscious or whatever you're going to do. And then mm. usually just before falling, I'm falling asleep or maybe I'm in a queue. Usually you have to be doing something dreadfully mundane and boring. And then the idea hits. And I'm like, oh, if I tried to work that out myself, uh, my brain would never have come up with it. But actually just that kind of letting it sit and that bit of time just seemed to... Uh, now, I don't know if that's quite the question you're asking. I mean, you're asking, is it the book? Firstly, the cover is so good. And that's nothing to, <laughs> that's nothing to do with me. So I can fully praise the cover. Uh, this was Fiona's uh, vision. And uh, she, when she sent through the cover uh, to me, I was actually in with my partner, John, in Killarney. And uh, I was sitting in the cafe and Fiona's email came through. I knew it was the cover. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And John was looking at me, I was kind of going. And then I opened it and I could just feel the hairs in the back of my arms go up. I was like, oh. She's got it. She's got everything I wanted from the cover, you know, just in terms of the the heat and the exoticism and the, mm. uh, just the kind of yeah, shimmering. And even just sitting on a shelf, it just looks so striking. So that that's all Fiona. So it is, I have to say, what I didn't even have it clear in my head, but then when it was there, I was like, that's exactly what I wanted. So <laughs> I'm delighted. Mm. <laughs> Um, I suppose we ask if anyone has any questions um, from the group. There's a Q and A box where you can um, where you can throw a question in. Uh, Fiona's just uh, just said the cover was designed by Becky Kelly, um, and she claims she has little credit to take in this process, but uh, we doubt that <laughs> very much. Um, I believe there was um, a question earlier on uh, asking about your editing process from Helen. Would you like to tell us a little bit about editing? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I suppose you, you know, I would edit kind of bigger, smaller, you know, that would be the kind of standard way. So you're dealing with chapters first and then you're dealing with... The weird thing was this book, compared to other things that I've written, it it's seven characters, three chapters each, seven days. Like it's very seven... It was such a lattice that it was very hard to kind of once it was written, it was that, it, it was that thing. It was, it kind of shaped up to be funny. There was one chapter in the middle, which is when they go to see Tom Cruise climb. The, well, 
uh, an actor <laughs> uh, climbing. <Yes. laughs> uh, and uh, I actually wrote that from Rocco's point of view first uh, in the child's voice, uh, just because I wanted the voice of somebody, ah, interesting. somebody who like, he wasn't born in Dubai, but he was so young that Dubai is all he knows. And uh, actually it just didn't work in the end with the whole, it wasn't, it wasn't giving Siobhan her space. And that was the perfect chapter to have Siobhan in, uh, which was a uh, Marianne actually kind of suggested that. Uh, mm. When I edit on a line kind of level, uh, what usually happens is I'm kind of look reading and quite often there's scaffolding where you say something and then you show it and you've done it twice. So it's like, I, mm. I, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, uh, Siobhan, oh, uh, Siobhan stepped outside. The wind blew through the trees and Siobhan looked up at the sky. That first sentence is scaffolding. You're just telling the reader Siobhan stepped outside. We're actually, you're, and then you show in the next sentence, like Siobhan uh, stepped out, you know, you, it's so. But the environment. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I find my initial kind of first round of edits is all that kind of stuff where I'm like, this is boring. I just told the reader the same thing twice. And this is really, they don't even realize on a conscious level it's boring, but it drags the book. It's like a weight. So, mm. uh, and I think Fiona would have been driven demented. She's like, you have to stop like moving one word here <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, so that maybe goes through a number of rounds and and then usually when I feel the sentences are getting near where I want them to be I put a word in and then the next round oh I'll take that word back out I'm starting to and then I'm like okay I'm getting near to the point where I feel it's that the the prose is where I want it to be uh, and then certainly with short stories the last thing I do is I read it backwards so uh, mm. I start at the end of the, of the piece and you just read the sentence out loud clearly and then you go to the sentence before and you read that out loud clearly and you work your way back through the text and the reason why that's a great last edit to do is because it removes narrative because obviously the story is being told backwards and that means you pick up all the typos because you don't get sucked into story so you, all the ands and the thes and the commas and all that that are uh, mm. that you've missed because you know when you're editing and you get three pages in and suddenly you're reading story instead of sticking with the nuts and bolts of the words on the page. So, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so that would be my last round of edits. And then it goes off to somebody else and somehow there's still typos. <laughs> <laughs> oh my so. God, well, you can tell that you're really like rigorous in your in your editing, in your writing in general, because you've crafted something so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Got a few more questions. We've got some really lovely messages of congratulations. Congratulations, Jamie. Um, on a wonderful achievement. Uh, more congrats from Sinead uh, Kodahi, uh, Kodahi, sorry. Um, Hi, it's great to be able to travel to Dubai this summer via Dive uh. for Pearl. Um, <laughs> uh, let me see. Yes, more huge congratulations. Here's now a good question asking how the past year and the lockdowns have affected your writing process. It's a great question from Anita. Thank you, Anita. Uh, oh, last year. I think it's been both plus and minuses. It's like, in some ways, it, it's given you something, you know, it's given you time, but in other ways, uh, sometimes I'm almost better to have just a fixed amount of time when I have to do something in between something and I really focus as the mind, where sometimes just the never getting out of a pair of sweatpants <laughs> really <laughs> doesn't do much for the motivation. Uh, so my, methodology that just keeps the momentum going when I'm writing is I write 500 words a day that's it just 500 words a day which is actually an hour's work and it's it's kind of small enough that you can't find a reason to not do it uh so you always will do it and then somebody sit down 500 and suddenly it's a thousand or 800 or something like that and, and that's fantastic uh mm. but just because I write a thousand today doesn't mean I get a freebie tomorrow like it's 500 the clock strikes at midnight and I'm back to my 500 <laughs> and the reason being for that is for me if I lose momentum on because I'm writing a new novel uh, after this and I hope lockdown has been Yay. amazing for that. It's so, uh, <laughs> but I find little and often is far more effective than not writing for five days during the week and then saying, oh, I've Saturday off now, I'll do like 5,000, you know, and absolutely kill it because five mm. days of not writing, the trail goes cold, you know, and, and I, you know, when I talk about that relationship with the subconscious, you need to keep constantly telling your subconscious this is important. And that kind of 500 words a day lets your subconscious no, the wheel, the wheel has to keep spinning. Uh, yes. So, uh, 
So in a way, lockdown has been good for time and I've definitely been hitting my 500 words a day. Uh, and I suppose for anyone out there who's maybe considering writing, 500 words a day is 130,000 words a year. Just remember that. So uh, that's amazing. So you will literally, <laughs> you know, and that's well over a novel. That's nearly two novels. So, you know, so it, 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 it sounds tiny, but you can have a novel done in a draft of it nine or 10 months if you do that consistently. Mm. So, uh, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, I've, I've hit burnout a few times this year, kind of just yeah. because there's no division between morning, noon, night, weekends, like, and I just don't know how to say I'm leaving a space now and that's my workspace and now I'm, you know, and that's definitely happened and I'm useless at that. I honestly, I, I'm a constantly, as I'm whispering to myself all the time, you're just, you need to do more, you're not good enough, you're not good, you know, it's that kind of chatter that goes on and. Oh my God, yeah. I, uh, and out of that means that I have a tendency to just burn the candle a bit too much. And then about once every five weeks, my partner has to listen to me go, oh, I'm burnt out and blah, blah, blah. And then I crash for three or four days. And then suddenly I start the loop again and I'm aware of it and I still do it. So <laughs> I'm like, it sounds like a terrible pattern for you, but it's given us this. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Jamie, but you're just going to have to stay in that pattern. Um, uh, there's now a few couple of uh, kind of housekeeping questions here now. Uh, when do we know when the book will be available on audio? It may I be there already. Don't know. I, that's maybe a Fiona question. Uh, I haven't heard, to be honest with you, I, I actually don't know if that's... Uh, I should maybe, know that. Oh, goodness. Um, oh, no, don't, don't be silly. <laughs> Fiona maybe might throw it in the um, in the chat box maybe for yeah. us or unmute if you like, Fiona, uh, and let us know. Um, no oh, audio Chris. edition as yet, but they're working on it. So that's uh, forthcoming, Terry. Uh, thanks for asking, yeah. though. Um, and uh, let me see, there's another great question here. Um, from the initial idea for your novel to the moment you held the final book, what was your favorite moment in the whole process? Uh, okay, I have two questions. One is the kind of external stuff. And of course, like having Marianne take me on and then having Fiona take, like that was such amazing moments because it just, you know, it felt like validation. It felt, you know, okay, I love to write and I'd love to be creative, but everyone likes to have someone have, you know, appreciate their work and to have people I know who, yeah. who know what they're looking at, you know, who are experts at what they do to kind of go, you know, we like what you do and we believe what you do was, was, was hugely kind of gratifying and, and really helpful actually to me and on an on emotional level. Because yeah. there's always the days where you doubt yourself and there's not, they're not occasional days either, you know, they're, they're a regular thing and you just get a few rejections in a row and suddenly, I don't know what it is with the human mind to just pick up on all the things where you're getting rejected. You know, you soon. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, oh no, my therapist uh, is like, oh, we're like Velcro to criticism and rejection. Yeah. Like, you know, we stick to that. Anyone says anything yeah. nice, we're like, well, I mean, yeah. that person's yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or they're just saying that they're just being nice. You know, that kind of. Oh yeah. Completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, writing the book, uh, the actual words on the page, I really enjoyed writing the Trevor Siobhan dynamic because I have siblings that I'm really close to and the warmth that they have between them I just look straight at those like it just was so easy to write because I just I have two amazing sisters who uh, are older than me who I grew up gay and I was never bullied in school as gay, as gay. Uh, and I know that is because they were terrified of my sisters. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. And I feel very blessed because I know that's not everyone's story. So, uh, <laughs> are they here now tonight? I think they may be. I'm not sure. I don't. Uh, but actually, one of my sisters is a therapist, so I know she's got some clients. So she's kind of doesn't know if she. Could, she was like, I really will try and see what she can do. But I know like it's important what she does. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, and can you talk about your next project at all? I can, I'll tell you that I wanted a new challenge and if, I won't say kind of too much, but I'll say a little bit because I'm terrified that I'll tell you about the book and jinx it. And then Marianne is going to read it and I should be like, this isn't working. And I'll be like, actually that <laughs> book is never going to happen. That book is just going to sit in a drawer like a few other manuscripts. But um, <laughs> with, Dubai book that's there as I said I drew a lot on kind of my short story background and the structure and for me I really wanted the challenge of staying with one voice and it's actually over a few decades uh so that 
was to, I was drawn to doing that next, just a simple start at A and end in B. And what I was really interested in is it's, uh, uh, it's it tells the story of a person, uh, it's, it's an artist, and uh, I'm really interested in something that happens like 30 years ago, and then suddenly this reach, the shadow suddenly reappears 30 or 40 years down the row. Uh, it's really about uh, uh, a girl and her mother, and it's the uh, and how that relationship with her mother actually ultimately affects her relationships with her partners. It's very I'm I'm I'm, I'm not explaining it very well, but I think it's a lot about how the relationship we have with our parents ultimately uh, impacts so much of our later life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like you know, you are you know you you create portraits of characters. You know, I think that sounds like a really rich theme to be mining for this mm. next book. And like, yeah. I definitely know as a Jamie O'Connell fan, I'm really mm. excited to see you move into like a, you know a different space and mm. see what you do there. Well, um, <laughs> so I love the sound of that. And um, I suppose we should begin to wrap up. But um, thank you so so much for giving Thank us you, <laughs> all of your time and giving Thanks. us all your talent in this Thank absolutely you. fantastic book and I hope everyone here goes and buys Diving for Pearls because honestly it is such a treat reward Thank yourselves you. bank holiday weekend now oh yeah perfect time <laughs> Thank you Sophie Thank you so so much oh, yeah Thank you everyone sorry thank you everyone for coming tonight I really appreciate you all the support so uh Congratulations, Hi. Sophie and Jamie. That was absolutely fabulous. I hope uh, I hope that you both enjoyed it as much as we yeah. did. So congratulations Thanks. to both of you and huge Thank congratulations you. to Jamie on your Thanks. on your Thanks book birthday. <laughs> oh, I hope everybody goes out and gets Great. it and, and enjoys it as much as we did. Thank you. Great. And I forgot to I forgot to go and pour myself a glass of something. So I'm I just sorry. Ready to get ready to get <laughs> a top up. Oh <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Lovely. Thanks, guys. That's oh. great. Thank you so much. Thanks Cheers. So much for coming, everyone. Thanks to all of you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>